Hola, buenos días. Primero agradecer a Jordi que, que nos dé este seminario eh, y podamos disfrutar de, de, bueno, de todo lo que nos va a enseñar. ¿no? Eh, Jordi Castro es catedrático de la Universidad Politécnica de Cataluña y es un especialista en, en muchos temas de optimización, pero bueno, el tema es que nos va a hablar hoy es sobre métodos de punto interior y, la, y algunas aplicaciones. Eh, bueno, Jordi ha publicado en revistas... Bueno, tan prestigiosa como Matemática Programming, Management Science, es editor de, asociado de varias revistas. Bueno, y es un placer, Jordi, y que estés con nosotros y, y nada, adelante. Gracias. Okay. Eh. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks to all of you for inviting me to this to, to give this seminar. Um, uh, I think uh, the length of the talk will be about 45-50 minutes. And today I will talk about uh, a, 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 an interior point method that I have been working in the last years in my research, um, which is tailored for the solution of block angular problems, big, big problems with many variables, many constraints, but with a block angular structure. Okay. So this talk it's very similar to a talk I gave uh, three years ago at Google. In, in Manhattan, they invite me to give a talk, and I give a talk which was very, very similar to that one, okay? Okay, so um, this is the, the structure of the talk. Uh, first, I will just give few ideas of the interior point method, because maybe uh, some of you maybe are not specialists in interior point method, so I want to give the basic ideas. I, I'm not going to enter into details, okay? And in the second part, I will talk about some applications um, uh, I've been solving in the last years using this particular interior point method, okay? So, okay, let's just start with the presentation of uh, this particular interior point method. Well, why a method for structured problems? Well, structure is very important in optimization, as you know. Many problems have several periods, a multi-period structure or multi-commodity structure, and uh, so that means that we have different blocks and all these blocks are linked by a set of linking constraints. This particular structure appears in many, in many situations, in logistics, in telecommunications, in big data and data science. Uh, the, 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 the common feature of all these problems is that they are very large. They, are, they have a structure, but they, they are very large. Okay? So when you have a very large problem, you can use interoperable methods. Interoperable methods are very good when you have problems with millions of variables, okay? All of us know that interpret methods are implemented in Cplex, in Groby, in Express, in Mosec, but um, you are not an expert with interpret methods. I can tell you that at each iteration of an interpret method, we have to solve a system of equations, and all these packages, Cplex, Groby, Express, Mosec, they solve the system of equations using a Cholesky factorization. When the Cholesky factorization is very difficult, the interpol method is not going to be efficient. And that's why some researchers, one of them, uh, I am among, among them, have been working in the application of conjugate gradients uh, in combination with Cholesky factorization for the solution of the system of equations, okay? So the method I'm going to tell you now, uh, I, I have been working in the last days, as, as I said before, and uh, I have, develop and improve this, this method in several papers, in publishing in, in several journals in the last years, okay? And it's implemented in a package in a solver, which is named bot IP, okay? Okay, uh, a few details about the method. The problem solved by this method is the following. It's something like that. We minimize uh, some objective function, and the, the, the main feature is that in this problem, we have k different groups of variables. So, my constraints, my, my, my constraints matrix has this particular structure. The blue bar are blocks associated to the different groups of variables. So for the first group of variables, we have the constraint n1, x1 equal to v1. For the last group, nk, xk equal to vk. So we have k groups of variables. And of course, we have some linking constraints, the red bar, that link the values of all these variables, okay? And the objective function, it's a sum of the objective function for each group. Okay, so we have a sum for all these blocks, okay? So that's the situation. Um, this algorithm works when the objective function is linear or quadratic. That, that's 
uh, as long as the quadratic term, the quadratic matrix is diagonal, okay? In, in the simplex world, if we have to solve this kind of problem with this particular circle, we have some approaches. For instance, we can use density wall decomposition. We have cutting planes to solve th these particular situations, but we can also apply interrupted methods. Uh, how, what's the idea behind an interrupted method? I'm going to explain you a little bit how interrupted methods work, okay? But, but very quickly. Let's consider this particular problem. Minimize some convex function f of x subject to linear constraints and these inequalities. Uh, these are the Lagrange multipliers of the constraints. An interpret method tries to solve the Karos Kantaker conditions of this problem. The Karos Kantaker conditions of this problem are this one, this one is the gradient of the Lagrange with respect to x has to be equal to zero. This is the feasibility ax equal to b, and that's the complementarity. This last equation is the complementarity. For instance, x greater or equal to zero has as multipliers z, so x times z has to be zero, and the same for the upper bound, okay? So the main, the, the, the trick with the interpret method is that this complementarity condition, uh, the right-hand side that should be zero, remember in complementarity condition, x times the multiplier should be zero. This zero is replaced by a positive value mu, and for each mu, we have a different solution to the system. This system is named the KKT mu perturbed system, okay? For each mu, we have a point in this, in this curve, which is named the central path, okay? The central path is the, the curve made by all the solutions of these points for any mu, okay? Interpret methods follow approximately the central path. So an interpret method can start here, we compute point x1, x2, until it converges to the optimal vertex of, of the problem, okay? So that's the general idea. To compute these points x0, x1, x2, in an interpret method, we have to solve this system of equations at each iteration. This is the system of equations to, co to be computed to obtain the, 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 the direction of movement of the dual variables, of the Lagrange multipliers, okay? Here, I, I'm all interested in, in the form of the system. This system is A, the matrix of the, pro the, the constraints matrix, times A transpose, and zeta is just a scaling matrix, and this is scaling matrix, and, and I'm not going to enter into details, but this scaling matrix is diagonal, and changes at each iteration. The values of the scaling matrix depend on the values of the current point. At that zero, we have a scaling matrix, at point x1, we have a scaling matrix, and so on, okay? Okay, so if we want to be efficient with an interval method, we need to solve efficiently this system of equations. These are named the normal equations, okay? A, zeta, A transpose, systems with this matrix. Let's see which is the structure of this matrix when you have a problem with a structure, okay? I'm going back. Remember, this is the structure of matrix A. So we have to solve system, systems with A times A transpose and a scaling matrix in the middle, okay? Let's see. This is A, okay? I have the K blocks, the linking constraints. This is zeta. I have, zeta can be divided for the zeta one for the group of variables one, zeta two for the second group of variables, zeta K for the K groups of variables, okay? Let's compute the structure of A, zeta, A transpose, okay? A, zeta, A transpose has this form. This first block, it's the, the block, uh, A, remember, A, it's divided into parts. The block part, the linking constraints part. So A, zeta, A transpose will have four different parts. N times N transpose, N times L transpose, L, N transpose, L, L transpose, okay? This part will be named B. This part is C, C, C transpose, and this part is D, okay? B, this matrix, it's block diagonal, okay? Has K smaller blocks, okay? So if we want to solve a system with A, Z transpose, we can use this partitioning. And that's what we do here, okay? This system, it's system A, Z transpose times the direction of movement of the dual variables times the right hand side. Here, I divided the delta lambda into parts, the part of the blocks, the part of the linking, okay? Following the same partitioning here, okay? If you want to solve this system, you can, doing some algebra, you can see that this system is equivalent to that, to these two parts. So this part is the part for computing delta lambda one, 
This part, you only need to solve systems uh, with B. But B, it's, it's not difficult because B, remember, it's this matrix has K smaller blocks, okay? Uh, so each of these blocks can be solved using actual ASCII factorization. So the whole B matrix systems with B can be solved using actual ASCII factorization. But what about the second part? This part, uh, in this part, we need to solve a system with D minus C transpose, the inverse of BC. We cannot compute that because this matrix first can be very large. If we have a lot of linking constraints, the size of the system is the, the size of linking constraints. These parts can be very large. And in addition, it can be completely dense. And, uh, 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 and then the, the, the enter the system, the more difficult will to solve. So the idea is solve this part with actual SK factorization and solve this part using a conjugate gradient, okay? But to solve this with a conjugate gradient, we need some good preconditioner, okay? Remember, the preconditioner tries to, to improve uh, um, the spectrum of this matrix that, that tries to concentrate the eigenvalues of this matrix in, in small groups, okay? Uh, because then the number of iterations of the conjugate gradient will be smaller, okay? Okay, so, um, uh, again, without entering into, the, into details, it can be proved, uh, it's proved in these two papers, that there is an analytical expression for the inverse of the matrix to be solved with the conjugate gradient. The inverse of this matrix given by that. That's an infinite series. This is a conversion series because the spectral radius in this part is less or equal than one. That, that's something that can be proved. This part goes to zero. This term goes to zero when I goes to uh, increases, okay? That's because the spectral radius of this matrix is less or equal than one, okay? So the preconditioner will be this, this that exactly, this red term. But of course, we cannot use infinite number of terms for the preconditioner, that will be too expensive. So the idea is consider a small number of terms of this. So for instance, if you ever consider one term, okay? The preconditioner will be exactly D minus one. I'm going back. D, remember, is this, is this matrix. This matrix is L times L transpose, okay? It's the, it's the link constraints multiplied by them transpose, okay? That's the idea, okay? So D is this matrix. So we have to compute systems with matrix D. If we add more terms, we complicate the preconditioner, will be better, but we complicate the, the application of the preconditioner, okay? So the quality of the preconditioner depends. First, the spectral radius, I'm going back, Sorry, the spectral radius of this of this matrix. The, the, the smaller is the spectral radius, the farther from one, the better is the preconditioner. Unfortunately, a priori, when you try to solve a problem, we, we don't know how good will be the spectral radius. That's something that it depends on the data of the problem. The second parameter that controls the quality of the preconditioner is how easy are the solutions of systems with matrix D, okay? If the factorization of D is it's easy, that's good for the preconditioner because at each iteration of the, pre of the conjugate gradient, we need to solve a system of equations with matrix D, okay? So um, the, if D, it's a simple matrix, that's, that, that, that's, that, that's a benefit for, for the algorithm, okay? So these are, these are the main ideas. These are the main ideas of, of this algorithm, okay? Um, and I, I just want to, to mention you a couple of theoretical results that we obtained in previous papers. That was that when you solve a quadratic problem or a nonlinear problem with, with, with a non-zero non -zero Hessian, okay? The, the preconditioner is better. Why? Because the, the spectral radius, spectral radius is far, it's, it's smaller than one, okay? So that, that does not, that's something that, that can be proved. The, the, the conjugate gradient in this interpreter method is more efficient for quadratic than for linear problems. Indeed, it can be proved that if the quadratic term of the problem goes to infinity, the spectral radius goes to zero. And that means that the conjugate gradient will be very, very efficient. We can solve if only one or two conjugate gradient iterations the, the, the linear system of the interior problem method. That's an example of that. 
Okay, that's an example that illustrates these two propositions. These are results for uh, some problems. Uh, I will show you this problem later. Okay, it's, it, it's the first example I want to show you. This is a problem for data. It's a data confidentiality problem, and in this this problem we are considering a quadratic uh, objective function. So the objective function is only x transpose q x. Um, there is no linear term. It's only quadratic. This is an instance with 10 million variables and 200,000 constraints. And here we solved the problem for different values of the quadratic term. The quadratic term was an identity multiplied by beta. Okay? The, the, the optimal point is always the same because we only have this quadratic term. But uh, the objective function will, the, the money measure is always the same, but the, the, the minimum, the value of the object, objective function of the money measure will change because we are modifying this, this bit. Okay? And these are some results we have for, for this problem using CPLEX 11. I, I obtained this, this, all, this result some years ago. And this is specialized interrupt method. Okay? And these are the results we took for different betas. So uh, increasing beta, uh, the problem becomes a bit harder for CPLEX. So you see the CPU time. Uh, when beta is 0, 0, 0,1, the CPU time is. 29,000 seconds, when beta is 10, the CPU time is 35,000 seconds. But for the third point method, it's exactly the opposite. Increasing beta will make the problem more quadratic, more convex, and then the CPU time reduces slightly. Okay? And, well, you can see the difference. Uh, this specialized method combining Cholesky and conjugate gradients can solve these problems in one minute, and CPLEX required 10 hours approximately. The, such a good results are, uh, are only obtained in, in some particular parts, not in all of them, okay? So don't believe that these results are always obtained in any application. That depends. It happened in this application, but not in others. In other applications, the results are not so impressive, okay? Okay. Okay, so finally, to finish this, this first part of my talk, introducing the algorithm, okay? Uh, this algorithm has been implemented in this solver. It's named Block IP. It can solve linear problems, quadratic problems, um, and well, it has a lot of lines of code. It's written in C++. Has this number of lines of code. Okay. Well, now actually now it has 2,000 more lines because we are improving the code in an application working with Laureano and Juan Francisco for multi-stage optimization. So. Uh, the, the current number of lines is not 17,000, it's 19,000 actually, okay, and, and that's all, okay? So this was the first part. I know I was too fast, but I just want to give you a, a, a general idea of what's the algorithm, how it works, and what's, what are the report methods. And now, in the half an hour, I have until the end of the talk, I want to show you results with some particular application, some successful application using this particular algorithm. Okay? Uh, uh, the first application, it's a problem from, from, from the data confidentiality field. The second problem is it's the support vector machine problem. It's a machine learning tool. It's a machine learning problem. The third one will be the solution of uh, minimum convex flow problems in bipartite networks. Basically, it's solution of convex transportation problem problems. And the last one, it's an application in facility location. Let's start with the first one, OK? Um, let me explain to you this data confidentiality problem. This, this is a real problem. I, I, I worked in the last years in this kind of data confidentiality problems for Eurostat uh, and for other national in, uh, uh, statistical institutes uh, of, of Europe, OK? Uh, let me explain you quickly the problem. The problem is the following. Let's consider a statistical table as the ones released by National Inst Statistical Institute or Eurostat, the Statistical Institute of the European Commission. Okay? Um, these tables can be represented in the following in, uh, uh, as follows. A table, a statistical table, is just a vector of n cells. A is the vector of cells. And these cells satisfy some constraints. A a is the constraints matrix times A, the values of the cells, equal to B. For instance, 
If you have a two-dimensional table, you have two, two, two categorical variables, um, profession and city and region. And you try to compute the number of people working in this profession in this region, you have a two-dimensional table. So the constraints of a two-dimensional table is that the sum by rows have to be equal to the total, the sum by columns have to be equal to the total, okay? So that's the, that's the meaning of these equations. That's that, that's the way we represent a statistical table, okay? A two-dimensional table, a three-dimensional, any kind of table. In this method, this particular data confidentiality method is named minimum distance control at table and adjustment. And the idea is the following. Let's suppose that some of these cells are confidential. So the, the institute, statistical institute, cannot publish the value of some cell because they could be releasing a private information of me, of another person, or some individual, okay? So the idea is that we are going to perturb to change the value of some cells. Edge will be the, 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 the vector of perturbations added to the cells, okay? To, to, to the current values, to the true values, okay? So then we want to minimize the number of perturbations such that the value of the cell plus the perturbation has to satisfy the, the equations of the table. That means if you perturb the, the, the table, we still have to guarantee that the sum by rows has to be equal to the total, the sum by columns has to be equal to the total. So if some cell goes up, some other cells have to go down, okay? So, uh, and of course, we force some perturbations to apply. If not, the, the, the optimal value is make no perturbation, so the, the, the x will be zero. We will not perturb it. But we forced here, using this, con this equation, that some cells have to be perturbed. These are the, the sensitive cells, the cells that we want to protect, okay? So the final optimization problem is the following. Minimize the norm of the perturbation subject to ax equals to zero. That guarantees that the perturbation will guarantee the constraints of the table, and x, uh, the perturbations have to be between some minimum and maximum values, okay? That's the problem. So this problem, in some cases, has a block angular structure, so we can apply our algorithm. Let me show you that, in particular, three-dimensional three tables, that means a table obtained by the, uh, by, by the Cartesian product of three categorical variables, have block angular structure. Let me show you. Let's consider this example. Let's suppose that you, you have uh, a census, the census of Europe, of Spain, of any country, okay? And, and you cross profession, county, or region, and sex, okay? So you have a three-dimensional table. Our three-dimensional table will be something like that. We have, for each profession and county, the number of males in this table, the number of females in this table, and that's the total for males and females. So this table, has a block and when you try to represent this as constraints, you have a, a, a block angular because you will have first group of variables are for males. The second group is for females and you have some linking constraints imposing that the values of for males plus females have to be equal to the total. These are the linking constraints. Okay, so three dimensional tables have a block angular structure and if you want to solve this problem, you can use the block IP algorithm, the block IP specialized in developer method. I'm going to show you some results in the solution of this problem for big tables, okay? Big tables means that we have many professions, many counties, well, not many sex, sex are only two, but th th these tables are tables for where we are crossing th three different variables, okay? Let me show you some results. Okay, well, I will show you results for two different norms. Remember that in the objective function, we want to minimize the norm of the X. So we can formulate the L1 norm, so that then we have absolute values. We have to split each variable into parts. That's the usual trick in optimization when you have absolute values. Or we can consider Euclidean norms. In Euclidean norms, we only have one variable and we square it. So in that case, we have a linear optimization problem. In that case, we have a quadratic optimization problem. First, results for the L1 norm, linear optimization problems. Uh, the instances are given here by three parameters. Number of categories of the first categorical variable, that will be, for instance, 500 professions, 50 uh, counties or regions, well, 500 sex, it's impossible, but let's suppose that the third categorical variable has another meaning, okay? 
This is the number of constraints of the linear optimization problem. That's the number of variables of the linear optimization problem. The larger problems have 25 million of variables and 300,000 constraints. And this is the CPU time solving the problem using the specialized set and method block IP and CPLEX. Okay? The that's a linear optimization problem. Well, in this problem, we see that this approach was very efficient. The larger problems with 25 million of variables are solved in four minutes, 200, 400 seconds, while CPLEX needed several hours, six hours, six hours, here about 20 hours, okay? So we see that this method is very efficient in this particular application. For quadratic problems, the results are even better. Remember, I told you before that this algorithm is more efficient when the problems are quadratic, okay? So for quadratic problems, we'll see that CPLEX provides similar times, but block IP, it re reduces the CPU times. These are the results for quadratic problems. We see that the larger problems, well, now we have half of the variables, the larger instances don't have 25 million variables, they only have 12 million because we have half of the variables because we don't need to split the variables as in the linear case, because in the linear case, remember, we have absolute values, okay? So we see the CPU time for block IP, it's less than what, it's half a minute, one minute and half, and for CPLEX, the times are still very large, okay? So that's an example of a good application of this algorithm, okay? And moving to the second application, the second application, it's the support vector machine problem, uh, which is one of the most used tools in machine learning. Well, I don't know if you are familiar with support vector machines. I cannot see your faces, so I don't know if you already know the problem. Um, so I have a couple of slides just to explain a little bit how support vector machines in machine learning work. That's it, yeah. Uh, support vector machines are mainly used for classification. So let's suppose that you have two, you, you have a data set of points, okay? And you have two groups of points, two families of points in, 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 in this set. For instance, let's suppose here that you have two dimensional points. Each point is represented by X and Y, okay, two coordinates. And we have two groups of points, the triangles and the circles. So support vector machines uh, work by computing a plane, a hyperplane in Rn, here we are in R2, a plane that separates the triangles for the circles, one class for the, uh, the, 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 the one class for the other class, okay? So, um, for instance, let's look at this picture. For This picture shows two bad classifications. If you look at this plane, you can say, well, this plane, it seems to be okay because, well, it separates the triangles from the circles, and that plane, it, that's exactly the same. It, it also separates correctly triangles from circles. But why I'm saying that this is a bad classification? That's a bad classification because this triangle, it's too close to the other class. So this triangle, it's correctly in, in this class, okay? But it's too close to the other class. And exactly the same for the circle. The circle belongs to this class, okay, to this part of this, according to this plane, but it's too close to the other one. So that's a bad classification because that means that when we are exposed to new points, we might have errors, okay? We can conclude wrongly that this triangle belongs to this part of this circle to the other class. Good classifications are shown here. This plane, this dashed line, shows a good separation, separation plane. Why? because there is a big distance, the technical name is a big margin, a, set of goods, a big separation margin, margin between this class and this class. If you look, in this area, there are no points. So that means that we receive a new triangle and we apply this, this, this plane, just to so know we are on this side or on this side, we reduce the error of misclassification because we know that in this area there are no triangles, no circles, okay? So that's the idea. So support vector machines try to, to compute something like that, okay? So which are the parameters of this problem? Well, 
to solve a superorbital machine problem, you need first a matrix of n points and n features. Features means the, 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 the coordinates of the points, okay? The feature are the variables that define each point. Usually points are associated to individuals and, and, the, and, and, and the columns of the matrix are associated to attributes or variables for each particular individual. We also have a diagonal matrix, okay, made of these values, plus one, minus one, these are named the labels of the points. So, uh, in practice, we we don't work with triangles or circles. We work with points of the plus one class or points of the minus one class, okay? So, that's the idea. So, we have a matrix of n points. For each point, we have n features. And we have a plus one or a minus one for each point that tell us if that point belongs to this class, to class plus one or class minus one, okay? So, uh, that's... An example, well, again, I don't know if you are familiar with support machine. This is an example I showed to my students. That's a, something I computed uh, in Python. That, that's very easy. Don't think that that's difficult to, to, to do in, in Python. It's quite easy. That's an example for a support machine that tries to recognize the gender of a person just looking at a, a picture of the face, OK? Uh, again, uh, um, so in this particular example, uh, I have uh, the, 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 the matrix A, the database A, contains uh, pictures for many people. Um, each row contains the pixels of the person. So here, remember, for each individual, for each row, you have features. The features here, the variables, are the pixels of the person, OK? I have one. 1,500 pixels for these pictures. And the classification here, the level is, it's a woman or a man. So the idea is, you, you have pictures of persons, you compute a hyperplane that separates males for females, men for women, and then you receive new pictures, and you apply the picture to the hyperplane, and you decide if you are on the male or on the female part. And these are the results. It works pretty well. So for instance, well, this. Probably you know these guys or these ladies, okay? This is this uh, Hollywood actor. This is Keanu Reeves. Well, this is the Neo of the Matrix movies, okay? And it's a man. It's a man. And the super machine predicted that that's a man. It, it works well. This is Angelina Jolie, and it's a woman. And the super machine predicted it's a woman. Um, there are some errors. For instance, uh, here, Bill Gates, this is Bill Gates. It's a man, but the support vector machine predicted it's a woman. Exactly the same here. That's Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's a man, but the support vector machine predicted it's a woman. And there is another error here and here. It's difficult to know why we have errors in that case. But I don't know. My explanation is that when you look at this face, this or this, these three men are smiling. So for some reason, when the pictures are smiling, the support vector machine concludes it's a woman. And this is another Hollywood actor. Well, I don't know if you know her. Well, it, some of you are of my same age, so probably you know this is Winona Ryder, okay? And um, it's a woman, but it concludes it's a man, but it's very serious. It's not smiling. So I don't know. It's, oh, it's difficult. These tools in machine learning, they work well, but when they fail, you don't really know why they fail, okay? So, but that's just to show you that, well, these things work. Well, to be honest, today, the main application of super machine is not classification of pictures. Neural networks are better for pictures, but still super machines are very useful to classify uh, text. So you have a bunch of text of documents and you want to classify them if a text that talks about politics or about history, okay? Uh, super machine, it's a very good tool to classify text, okay? Okay, so that's the optimization problem. I don't want to enter too much into details, but <laughs> that, that's the primary formulation of the support vector machine problem. Basically, it has two parts. The objective finds about well, um, how much time? Well, um, well, very quickly, the support vector machine, you need to compute. W is the normal vector of the plane. Gamma is the intercept of the independent term of the plane. Rs are as like variables that compute the misclassification errors. The errors when some triangle, it's uh, it's put in the circle area, in the circle region, okay? So that's objective function. Basically, 
the purpose of this objective function is try to make as large as possible the separation merging of the two planes and at the same time to reduce the misclassification errors. Okay? Um, well, that's the primal formulation. Again, I don't want to enter into this. That's the dual formulation, that's the dual. You compute the, the dual of this problem, you get that. But for me, what's important is that in even either if you solve the primal of the dual with an interim method, you will have to solve systems with this matrix A, A transpose. If you solve the primal, you will solve A, A transpose, okay? Systems with this matrix. If you solve the dual, you have A, A transpose in the objective function. So you also have A, A transpose. And remember that A is the matrix that contains N points and all the features of the points. Yeah, M by N matrix. Number of rows, it's points. Number of columns, it's associated to the features of the variables, okay? Um, what's the problem? The problem is that in support vector merging problems, A, it's almost dense. So A, A transpose, it's almost dense, okay? So let's suppose that you have a, a database with 10 to 5 points. That's not strange, that's quite usual. 10 to 5 points. So that means that A, A transpose will be a full dense matrix of 10 to 5 by 10 to 5. So the number of entries of this matrix will be 10 to 10. And you then you have to solve system of equations with a matrix of 10 to 10 number of non-zeros at each iteration. That can be very difficult for an integral method. Indeed, integral problem methods were used for the solution of support vector machines at the beginning, but in the last years, they are not being used no longer. Why? Because they are so expensive because they have to solve this system of equations. Well, recently, I have been working on trying to improve that. Um, this is something that has not been published, so please don't talk about that, okay, because I'm just working on the paper on this. The idea is, Let's suppose that you have the database with endpoints and you split the database in k parts. So you divide your database of endpoints in k smaller parts, k smaller parts, okay? So that means that let's suppose that you solve k different support vector machine problems, each with a subset of points, but of course we want that the support vector machines computed are the same for all the for, for all for all the subsets because they are come for the same set. So we can add these linking constraints. So that's the idea. Take A, split in different parts in the smaller support vector machines. Each of them we have a different uh, uh, a hyper plane defined by the, this normal vector, this independent term, and then force that the plane of Support vector machine i has to be equal to the plane support vector machine i plus one. What's the benefit of that? The benefit of that is that if you solve the whole problem without this splitting, okay, you have to solve this system of equations with A A transpose. Uh, solving a Cholesky factorization of that had the cost it's all m to the cube. Remember, Cholesky factorizations, solution of system of equations have cost m, m is the number of points to the cube, is the size of this matrix. If I just split the matrix in k smaller parts, then I have to solve k systems, okay? I have to solve one system for each part, k systems, but each system has this size, m divided by k to the cube. Then you do this operation, you have that the cost of this is m to the cube divided by k2. So this is much smaller than that. But of course, to do that efficiently, we need to cope, we need to consider the linking constraints, but that's good for our method. Because our method is especially tailored for problems where you have blocks and linking constraints. Okay, so the support vector machine problem can be formulated this way. This is a split formulation of the support vector machine. Here I'm showing some results with some. These are real problems used in the machine learning community. I have divided into parts. These are problems with a small number of variables. So, for instance, a nine a. It's a problem with. 32,000 points and 123 variables each point, okay? This is a huge problem, half a million points, but each point has only 54 features or variables, okay? And the second part are more difficult problems because the number of points, it's small. Well, 
sorry, the number of points, it's a small or not, because in that case we have 72,000, but the number of features, it's very large. It's much larger than here, okay? For instance, this program, RCB1 or NEWS20, this is a program of classification of text. These are real programs of classification of text, okay? This is a program by Reuters, the, the, the news agency of the British news agency. This is a program where we want to classify 20,000 documents, and each document is represented by a dictionary of 47,000 words, okay? Um, current interior porn methods have been very good at the solution of this kind of problems, probably with few features. But when you have a large number of features, we'll see now that current interpret methods cannot solve these kind of problems. Let me show some preliminary results. Okay, these are results using my algorithm, block IP for support vector machines, CPLEX, and this code, it's probably today, up to now, the best code for support vector machine based on interpret methods. It's a code developed by Gonzio in the University of Edinburgh, okay? So, if you, if here in blue, in blue here, you have the most efficient result, in red, the, the, the worst. In blue, the best, in, in red, the worst. So, when the programs have a small number of variables, usually CPLEX and SVM OOPS are very good, okay? In general, in general, not always, all perform uh, block IP. But when we go to the second set of fronts, when the number of features is very large, we see that our approach is much, much more efficient. For instance, OOPS was unable to solve these problems. It, it did, could not start the optimization, okay, because it because memory requirements. Um, but our approach was very efficient. For instance, in this problem, we need 22 seconds, C plus more than 20,000. This from the classification of this database by Reuters, the British news agency, okay? Our algorithm took 13 seconds and CPLEX 700, okay? And the same. Okay, again, these are preliminary results. This is not yet published. I, I, I'm working on that, uh, on this paper, and I hope it, it, I, will, I will submit it very soon to some, to some journal, okay? Okay, next application. I think that will be the last one, okay? Uh, because uh, we are almost on time. Uh, last application, solution of transportation problems. That sounds strange because transportation problem, it's a very famous problem, have been studied by many researchers, there are many papers, but still we were able to improve uh, the state of the art of the solution of transportation problems. So let's consider that transportation problem. I think all of you are familiar. Uh, that's a transportation problem. Remember, we have a, a set of supply nodes, we have a set of demand nodes, and we want to fulfill the demand by sending some items from the supply nodes, okay? So in that problem, uh, we have this objective function, it's sent for every supply, as every origin, every destination of some cost of sending some xij units from i to j. Fij can be linear or quadratic, or no linear convex, that's, this algorithm is valid. That's a transportation for linear, quadratic transportation, or convex nonlinear transportation problems. These are the equations of, uh, that for every destination node, we have to fulfill the demand. So all the items sent from all the origins have to fulfill the demand. Um, these are the constraints for the origin, the supply nodes. We consider that this is a less or equal constraint. So all the items sent from node i have to be less or equal than the supply of that node. Uh, that could be an equality, but in that case, we consider the more general case that uh, we don't need to, to send all the items generated at that node, okay? And we have some bounds, okay? That's uh, the transportation plan. This plan can be formulated following a block angular structure. It's also strange, but let's see. This problem can be reformulated in the following form, okay? Let's do the following. Let's consider that in our problem, M is the number of uh, destination nodes, demand nodes, okay? So we can do the following. We can consider that we have this number of blocks, X, both, both phase one, X1, both phase X2, both phase XM, 
are vectors of variables that represent, for instance, H1. This is a vector that contains all the arcs, all the variables that arrive in destination node I, okay? X2 is the vector that contains all the arcs, all the variables that arrive to demand node to destination node 2. And E, it's a vector of one. So this is a row vector of ones multiplied by that. So this by this, it's indeed computing the sum of all the items that are sent to destination node I. And this value has to be equal to the one, exactly for this and for this. So these constraints represent, impose that all the items sent to node I have to be equal to demand of this node. And these constraints, the linking constraints, have a special structural identities. These constraints impose that all the items sent from node I have to be less or equal than the supply S. Okay? So this is a reformulation of the famous transportation problem using a block angular structure. We applied a block IP to the solution of that, and we got very, very good results. Okay, this is something that was published this year. Okay, what was accepted last year has been appeared this year in, in Azure. Okay, so let me show you some results. Okay, these are results for problems considering linear integer cost. Why integer? Because to, comp to compare our algorithm, we consider C, but we also try it the best package for network optimization. Lemon. It's probably today the best optimization package for network optimization. Lemon contains almost all the algorithms in the famous book by Ahuja, Magnanti, and Orling on network optimization, in particular the capacity scaling, cost scaling, cycle canceling, and network simplex. So these are different transportation problems. The larger problem has 1,000 million of variables, so that's 1 billion, American billion, and 5 million constraints. This problem, it's a problem where the number of supply nodes are 200, and the number of destination nodes are uh, 200 million. Uh, sorry, 5 million. 200 origins and 5, 5 million of nodes. This problem could be interesting, for instance, for a company like Amazon, because Amazon has a few warehouses all over the world, but he has to transport to millions of, demand, uh, of, of customers, okay? So, we solved all these problems using, using block IP to different variants, simplex, dual, the two interreport variants, and all the algorithms in Lemon. In blue, we show the most efficient result. And we see that most of the blues are in block IP, okay? So we see and lemon was more efficient in some cases, okay? We can see that the largest problem, the problem with one billion variables, uh, was only solved by block IP, that was the fastest execution, and also by, by lemon. But again, lemon also works with integer cost. If we move to problems with floating real cost, okay, with fractional cost, then we can only use the network simplex on lemon, and in that case, it was never the most efficient alternative. In, when we have fractional cost, we see that the most efficient algorithm was always block IP. Okay, so the larger problems with one thousand millions of variables were solved in this number in six hours. Okay, that's but, but that's a good that's a large problem. Okay, simplex could not solve this this problem in, in within the time limit of five hours, okay? And for quadratic problems, we still can use block IP. These are results for quadratic transportation problems. We have block IP, we have simplex, and in that case, block IP was still even more efficient than simplex, okay? Could solve problems with one billion, 1,000 billion quadratic transportation problems in less than one hour, which is a very good result. Well, um, um, well, I will stop here, but I just want to tell you that we have also used this algorithm for the solution of facility location plans uh, using a vendor's decomposition. Um, 
because the subprongs of these vendors decomposition are very similar to the prongs in the minimum convex flow. Uh, so then, if you can solve transportation problems very efficiently, you can apply facility location problems using uh, uh, using block IP for the solution of the subprongs. But I think that's that's too much for today. You, you you have the slides here. You have the formulation. That's some results. And I just can only tell you that are the results that we were able to solve large facility location problems. Okay, with 600 million continuous variables, 600 binary value variables, three million constraints. Okay, and block IP solved this. This is an integer problem, it's a facility location problem in less than one hour, okay? But CPLEX could not solve any of the larger problems by memory requirements. He required too much memory, okay? But even in that case, this is the smallest case, okay? With uh, only, only 100 million continuous variables, we got a solution in 100 seconds, CPLEX required 10 more times, okay? This, the, 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 these results are available in a, in a paper in mathematical program, okay? Okay, and that's all. So, finally, uh, well, there are more applications there. There are more. For instance, uh, as long as you have a problem with a block angular circuit, you can apply this technology, this idea. For instance, we have solved two stage stochastic problem, problems. This was done recently. It was published in uh, Optimization Methods and so on. We are currently working with Laureano and Juan Francisco Monge in the solution of multi-stage stochastic optimization problems. This tool, this technique can be applied. We are working on that. And, and there are many other applications, routing and telecommunication networks, and, and many more. Um, that's all. Uh, here you have a copy of the code if you are interested in it, only the binary version. And these are some reference about this specialized interval method. And that's all. Thanks for your attention. Bueno, muchas gracias, Jordi. Eh. Eh, sí, te voy a hacer alguna, pregun alguna preguntita. ¿no? Sí, dime, sí. Bueno, sobre. Tengo alguna curiosidad. ¿no? ¿Cuál es el mayor caso que habéis resuelto? ¿no? Este de, un, de mil millones de variables. Sí. No... sí. Como número de variables, este es el mayor. Este es problemas de transporte de mil millones de variables, pero tiene un poco de trampa y es que las restricciones son muy sencillas. Es muy grande el número de variables, pero, pero el problema tiene una estructura muy fácil, porque todos son vectores y matrices muy simples. Por sí, eso sí. funciona ese problema en, bueno, el, el más grande, el de, el de mil millones, aún así se llevó tres o cuatro horas, tardó bastante. Pero bueno, los otros códigos, state of the art en el mundo tardaban más, con lo cual, bueno. No, pero bueno, fácil, solo, solo generar el problema con mil millones de variables, Jordi, supone, bueno. Bueno, tú, 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 tú el otro día generaste un multietapa que era mayor. Sí, por eso, pero solo generar no tardaba, no, ¿cuánto, ¿cuántos minutos? Sí, casi, sí, no, sí. casi una hora. ¿no? En la error tardaba una hora, sí. Sí, eh, tengo una pregunta. Has dicho que, que, que la función sea no lineal, ¿no? Ayudaba a bloque IP, ¿no? Pero... La, la duda que tengo es, ¿ayuda realmente a bloque IP o, o le perjudica menos que comparativamente con, con CEPRES o otro optimizador? Bueno, que sea cuadrático ayuda. Es decir, que, que haya gesiana, que la función objetivo tenga gesiana, es decir, que sea cuadrático o sea no lineal, ayuda. Eh, en teoría, esto lo, lo comprobamos en un artículo hace unos años, que el si tienes el mismo problema lineal, el, el mismo sistema de ecuaciones, le añades un término cuadrático, el condicionamiento del gradiente conjugado mejora. Esto está probado, esto ayuda. Pero, claro, lo que, lo que ocurre es que por otro lado tiene efectos de que el problema de punto interior le cuesta más porque es cuadrático. Entonces hay que ver, uh, te ayuda a solucionar los sistemas de ecuaciones de forma más eficiente, pero el problema quizás le tenga más iteraciones de punto interior, con lo cual tiene que haber un balance. La mayoría de casos sale favorable. Vale la pena poner un término cuadrático, es lo que hemos visto. Vale la pena. Ay, gracias, Jordi. Hola, buenos días. Eh, Jordi, enhorabuena porque has condensado en 45 minutos muchos años de trabajo. Yo tengo una pregunta, es un poquito técnica. Eh, bueno, parece que Bloque IP no necesita muchas ayudas para llegar al óptimo, 
en los casos que has puesto, desde luego. Pero, ¿has considerado la posibilidad de que puedas llegar a ser útil el crossover? Um, ¿Crossover quieres decir? Que eh, bueno, pues saltar, saltar al... A, a una base. A uno de los, al dual o al, o al primal tradicionales. Cuando estás ya muy cerquita, pero puede ocurrir que, que no llegue a, a dar el óptimo en un número muy alto de iteraciones y estás encima. Es, es, a ver, uh, lo que ocurre es para hacer un crossover bien hecho, que, bueno, crossover para lo, lo, los que no, no, no estáis muy unidos en punto anterior, es punto anterior. A veces no se acerca a un vértice óptimo, se puede acercar a un punto de la cara óptima, pero no tiene por qué ser un vértice. Y luego tiene un proceso para llegar a un vértice. Esto va bien para optimización entera, para, para comenzar a iterar un branch and bound. Pero para hacer ese proceso tienes, hay que tener muy bien implementado el simplex. Por eso, hacer un crossover bien hecho necesitas el código de punto anterior y un código simplex muy bueno. Por eso, crossovers bien hechos los tienen solo los paquetes profesionales como Simplex, Gurobi, porque ellos tienen los dos códigos, tienen el punto anterior y tienen el Simplex. Cuando acaban pueden hacer ese proceso. Claro, yo, yo programar un Simplex bien hecho es, bueno, hacerlo bien como, como, como Simplex es, es, bueno, no, no, es que me llevaría, ya, ya llevo media vida vivida, me llevaría la otra media vida y, y no voy a dedicar mi otra media vida a programar un Simplex ahora, bien hecho, pero me llevaría mucho tiempo. Lo ideal sería, bueno, la solución esta, pasársela a alguien que la pudiera aprovechar, como a Simplex o a Urobi, entonces esto sí que se podría hacer. Pero no pues le en ese sentido. Ah, vale. Esto no, no, no lo he probado, pero sería coger la solución a la que llega Blockipe, que se llegue en un punto, y ese punto se le da a Simplex y que, y que comience. Pero Simplex no sé si da estas ayudas, no sé si tiene rutinas que, que permitan conectar con el solver de, de, otro, de otra persona. Creo que es un paquete cerrado y ellos... Todos lo hacen allí, ¿no? no dicen, tú me das un punto y, y yo a partir de este punto comienzo a iterar. No sé si esto te lo deja hacer simples. Porque tampoco no le interesa mucho, porque ellos quieren que uses simples, no que uses una cosa externa a ella y luego le pases tú algo. No, no sé. No, no, no lo he probado, no lo he probado. Pero esto, me, esto daría bastante trabajo. Sería muy interesante, claro, pero daría trabajo. Gracias. Una, una última pregunta, Jordi. Hablando sobre la solución de problemas enteros, porque Cipres no, no permite resolver problemas enteros usando eh, un algoritmo de punto interior, que yo crea, ¿no? Sí, sí. Cipres tiene una opción que es solo el nodo raíz. El nodo raíz puede solucionarlo con punto interior. Porque hay problemas enteros que el nodo raíz es tan difícil de solucionar que si lo haces con un simplex se va a llevar yeah. muchísimo tiempo. Entonces, hay una opción en simplex que es cuando aplicas el branch -on te, dice, te, te, te deja escoger cómo quieres solucionar el punto, el punto el primer nodo, la función lineal. Y una opción es punto anterior y a partir de aquí el simplex dual en, en, los, en los hijos. Claro, ¿y cómo, ¿y cómo crees que debería ser el punto interior para hacer una ramificación? Porque cuando pones un corte te quedas fuera, ¿no? Entonces estás, contra, estás eh, al contrario de lo que te interesa, que es estar dentro, ¿no? ¿Cómo se, no sé si me he explicado, ¿no? Para hacer ver, un algoritmo de ramificación se podría aplicar... Punto anterior. Sí, sí lo, lo pasa que los de ramificación aprovechan mucho... Claro. Bueno, yo no soy experto en entera, pero cuando tienes un padre y generas los dos hijos, cuando generas los dos hijos, añades un corte que hace el problema infactible dual. Pero, sí. Perdón, infactible primal, pero factible dual. Y por sí. eso ramifican con el dual. Por eso, van reoptimizando con el Claro, ahí tiene la ventaja, el simple dual tiene la ventaja de la ramificación. Por eso, punto anterior se utiliza en, en entera solo en el nodo, en el primer nodo, y a partir de aquí ya aplica en el dual. Sí. Muchísimas gracias. Hasta luego. Vale, gracias. Adiós. Adiós.